Funchok stop down. I must tell you that in 2019, if I remember right, in September, we met at the uh, India Foundation Conference Maldives. And he told me, he told me, you know, Makrand, I'm writing a book called The Great Game in the Buddhist Himalayas. It's to be published by Penguin. And uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, write in great detail about this topic. And uh, he also said in the passing, he said, you know, there's so much ignorance about this area uh, in India, all over, even in the top circles, they don't know much. And uh, unfortunately, this lack of knowledge is causing us to make uh, some big mistakes, big mistakes, errors of both omission and commission. And I took it upon myself to read this book and also to try to follow the trajectory of Ambassador Top Dance thought. And I can't agree more with him. In fact, uh, after moving to Shimla, I came in contact with Himalayan Buddhism in a way that I had not before. Uh, I'll say a few words about that because this is the journey of all of us in India. You know, we hear about uh, Buddhism in our uh, school books and there they tell you very confidently that Buddhism disappeared from the land of its birth, which is absolutely wrong. I'll come to that in a moment. And then we learn that it is uh, Dr. Ambedkar. He brought Buddhism back. Uh, he converted a lot of his followers, about 500,000, to Buddhism. And that was called Navayana, influenced by the Sri Lankan variety. But, uh, you know, then, of course, uh, like many people, you come in contact with His Holiness. And uh, I, I took some teachings also. Uh, but again, I realized that uh, later on, I realized that this was a very partial notion of Buddhism. It's the dialectical Nalanda Buddhism. But Himalayan Buddhism is huge. It's magnificent. It's very complex. Going from Ladakh to Arunachal, you know, there's Sikkim, Bhutan, Darjeeling, Nepal, you know, all these territories. And of course, large swathes of Himachal Pradesh, our own state. You know, Kangra, Kinor, uh, and of course, Lahul Spiti. If you go to these areas, you begin to see, you know, a wide variety of practices. And and I think uh, Professor, uh, I mean, Stopdan, he's also a visiting professor, but I mean, Ambassador Stopdan is the most qualified person I know to enlighten us about this. The only thing I want to say is let's not forget that uh, Gautam Siddharth, who became Buddha, was himself a Himalayan. Kapilavastu was a Himalayan kingdom. And uh, you know, Buddhism never disappeared from the land of its birth. It flourished, and many varieties of it, it flourished. I met uh, some time ago, we went up to Bhajanath. I met, uh, I met the Tai Situpa, who is supposed to be the guru of the Karmapa. And I learned, you know, about the Mahamudra Buddhism and, uh, you know, uh, what a rich lineage, you know, going way back, Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa. You know, these are names that are legendary, Atisha uh, and all that, you know. But of course, the root guru, Guru Rinpoche, is Padma Sambhava for this whole region. And his, his uh, teachings are based on Tantrayan, Vajrayan, you know. He Vajra Tantra, you know, all these gods and goddesses uh, which we know very little about. And it's a very, very, I should say, rich tradition of ritual and practice. Unlike the dialectical tradition, which comes easier to us in India, we know a little bit, you know, about Upanishads, so the, the dialectical method, where you work things out mentally, uh, comes easier to us. But this tradition, with its esoteric practices and the tantric deities and the invocations and the empowerments, uh, you know, are a very, very powerful and rich sadhana. So this is one aspect, you know, of our topic today. The other aspect is geopolitics, strategy, you know, because we all know what has happened in Galwan. We all know, you know, the face of China that we face in this region and the uncertainty because the Chinese want to control the next incarnation of His Holiness also. We don't know as the Panchen Lama, there's already a Chinese Panchen Lama, and he's telling the Tibetans, as you know, to be loyal to the Chinese motherland. 
So we don't know the future of this entire uh, region with its uh, tremendous importance to India. And I recommend uh, Ambassador Stopdan's book. Please read it. It is an eye-opening book for all of us who are interested in this region and the future of India. I'll say a few words about him. He's, he's a most distinguished ambassador. He was in Kyrgyzstan, if I remember right, and he's written many books, many papers. He's an intellectual and he's a practitioner also. You know, He was the first secretary of the Embassy of India in Almighty, uh, Almaty, then a joint director of the National Security Secretariat. He was also an IDSA, if I'm not mistaken. And he's really uh, the most suitable person to take this discussion forward for us and to enlighten us on this topic. The last thing I want to say is that you might ask, you know, aren't these two completely different topics? One is spiritual, religious, Himalayan Buddhism. The other is strategic, you know, geopolitics. But no, in our entire Indian tradition, these are linked. We need both, like left and right hand, you know, because I remember in the Arthashastra, it says, without Artha, there's no moksha, okay? If you can't secure your land, if you can't secure your territory, and, uh, you know, there's a famous statement that the root of happiness lies in wealth. In, in wealth meaning in the proper dharmic production of wealth and securing of your resources. And in Himalayan Buddhism, the two major emphases are on, I think, wisdom, wisdom and compassion represented by the vajra vajra represents wisdom and the bell represents compassion you know it's also the male and female but uh, you, to act properly to act correctly in this world you need wisdom and if you just have wisdom and keep quiet you need for me compassion is what makes you act because compassion is what makes you think about the benefit of everyone, all sentient beings, not just your own family or your own friends, even your own country. So with these few words, I invite Ambassador Stopdanji to address us and I thank him. I welcome him to the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, although in a virtual mode. Thank you, sir, for agreeing and over to you. I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you, Professor Pranjpe and uh, wonderful uh, uh, to be with uh, all of you today and uh, I'm in a remote place in uh, Ladakh and uh, there is a problem of communication here well nonetheless I think uh, we will be able to uh, manage to go through this uh, discussion today well I'm uh, really not an expert on Buddhism and I understand uh, Professor Pranjpe has much more deeper knowledge about Buddhism than I do uh, you know, I pursue Buddhism not for knowledge. I pursue Buddhism for interest, uh, for my national interest. And uh, certainly it's true that Buddhism has disappeared or, um, or disappeared or not disappeared. That's another uh, debate. But I'm concerned that India's leadership role in the Buddhist world is receding. And almost uh, will be wiped out now because China is competing in this field, not just about Buddhism, also about the discourse of Buddhism. And I strongly believe that those who will control over, we will have control over Buddhism, the discourse of, of Buddhism, uh, then that that can that power will control Asia, at least Asia, if not the whole of the world, because. Uh, you know, I'm 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 a little bit worried because uh, yesterday I had a paper from United States, uh, which talked about the you know newly formed uh, court, the court uh, agreement that we have for four countries with Japan, Australia, India, and uh, United States, and they made it very clear that this uh, partnership or whatever alliance we have in the Indo-Pacific is not about any blood relationship and any commitment for our civilizational cultural commitment it's simply a matter of convenience uh, and please don't compare court with nato uh, with nato united states has a civilizational obligation you know to for the defense of the european civilization or western civilization and do not expect that 
that when we have taught the United States will treat India in the similar manner. And that's why you see now uh, the United States uh, under Biden administration has refused to lift ban on the raw material for the vaccine. And there are many other steps that the uh, United States have taken uh, despite all this uh, new alliance that we have formed in the Indo-Pacific. They are making it very clear that we are willing to supply all kind of material and medical support for for to to India to deal with the epidemic or this epidemic, uh, but they are not willing to make you the leader of the world pharmacy or the leader of the vaccine manufacturing. Uh, they are making it very clear, you know, you will have the leadership role. Uh, I will have the leadership role, but I'll support you. But uh, that's another kind of mechanism that we can deal with, but they're not willing to accept you. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that when it comes to the critical point, the, the Western world is trying to distinguish uh, themselves with us on a civilizational backdrop. And here, I think I'm very clear now, we have to stick to our own civilizational commitment, which is a Hindu Buddhist order. Whichever geography that we are talking about, we may have some adversarial relationship with United States, uh, with China, but don't forget that we are part of the civilization. Uh, but the unfortunate part of it is that even the Hindu civilization is uh, minimized or narrowed down to a certain concept, whereas Buddhist civilization is again, uh, it's almost has become an alien when I talk to people in the academia and the diplomacy in my own ministry, Buddhism is more of a lip service. You know, it's just a, a part of a language in diplomacy. You use it, but we don't have even a Buddhist emphasis in our diplomacy. The whole of Asia and Southeast Asia is a Buddhist country, but it is dealt by East Asia desk, uh, which is dealt by an undersecretary who knows about everything about diplomacy, but he's not specialized on Buddhism. So therefore, if the Mahas Sangharika or the Mahadharma center of Thailand or of Burma or Cambodia or Indonesia comes to India on a pilgrimage, he has been dealt by a, some undersecretary of the protocol division in the MEA who had no clue about the Buddhism. He must have passed through I mean, uh, passed exams of the UPSC, maybe through computer science. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, whatever we try all this kind of military political formation, we have to live in this world and we have to believe in this civilizational backdrop. That's why I think I picked up this topic after my retirement. My focus is on, on security, military issues, is Buddhism politics is uh, because I see every day uh, there is a new project that China has taken up uh, for six billion dollars they are supposed to have spent already, including in India including up, up to the, uh, among the Tibetans and the United States, Japan and Korea, Burma, everywhere. What they are trying to suggest is that the Siddhartha Gautam Buddha is a historical Buddha, that he appeared on this earth more than 2000 years ago. His era is over. And now, now it is the era of the Maitreya Buddha, which is the future Buddha, the coming Buddha. And Chinese want to prove that the future Buddha has already appeared and he has appeared in China. Now, unfortunately, this concept of Maitreya Buddha is as old as Buddhism. And Indian scholars actually know nothing about it. We, st we still feel that uh, Gautama Buddha is the only Buddha. But within the own Buddhist philosophy, Buddha's concept is not just a static one, it's a very dynamic. Uh, idea and the Chinese now Chinese are to say that look the ownership of Buddhism has to be with China and you see the global politics today the the both Gaya which is situated in uh, Gaya district of Bihar has suddenly disappeared from the UNESCO list instead they have added Lumbini and uh, there's a place in uh, Bangladesh where Panka, uh, the Pankar Atisha uh, was born, and uh, that has been now lifted uh, as a as a as a the one of the key center of Buddhism. 
Now, what they are trying to say is that Guru Padma Sambhava was an Afghan. He was, was born in Swat Valley uh, in the Northwest frontier province of uh, Pakistan today. Uh, and uh, Achitya, uh, the, the Pankar Atisha was a Bangladeshi. And uh, Lord Buddha, uh, the historical Buddha is a Nepali. And the other things they are trying to do, and the, therefore they are bringing religion and politics together. And therefore all this belt and road, for example, even the CPEC in Pakistan is now they are saying it is the Padma Sambhava route. Earlier they used to say the Gandhara route, but today they are more specific about uh, Padma Sambhava uh, track, which is from, from say, from uh, Takshila or uh, North Valley going right beyond into China. So the Chinese are using all these for their own political expansion, for geographical expansion, for the legitimacy of what they're doing in Asia. So we, we don't have a counter uh, uh, policy to deal with this issue. Instead, as I said, there is no scholarship on this idea. Our Buddhist uh, policy is tailored by our intelligence agencies or CIA outfit or intelligence bureau or all kind of a thing. They have the specific purpose, you know, maybe it's China centric, maybe something mischief you want to make here and there, but that's not a real scholarship. These are policies not based on the on the uh, you know the scholarly consideration. So therefore, even if we play, for example, the Buddhist card vis-a-vis -vis China, we still continue to lose territories, and at least still on the basis of Buddhism. And therefore, I I think I have taken this topic deliberately. The concept of the Himalayan Buddhism. I have revived this with this book published by a penguin. The Himalayan Buddhism is uh, the earlier British strategies used to use it during the you know great game with the with the with the uh, Russian Empire and the British Empire just to fight. And that time I think they used the Himalayan Buddhism to distinguish with the Tibetan Buddhism or the Chinese Buddhism or the Gandhara Buddhism or the or the Kashmiri Buddhism. There are different uh, geography about Buddhism. So the Himalayan Buddhism suddenly disappeared in the modern, uh, in the post-independent period. We started to club Himalayan Buddhism with the Tibetan Buddhism. Now, Professor Pranj has mentioned that the Indian Himalayan Buddhism is a specific to a Padma Sambhava variant of Vajrayana, the Siddha variety. So there, there are different layers of Buddhism in the Himalayas. And Siddhartha himself was from the Himalayas. And from the fourth century onwards, the Mahayana and the Vajrayana and then uh, the, the other Tantric Buddhism eventually came into, into uh, I mean, it is as old as the Buddhism traveled to China. If Buddhism could travel to China, Vietnam and Japan, how could they have not done it in the Himalayas? But unfortunately, we handed over the Himalayan Buddhism to to the forces across the border. I'm saying that Tibetan Buddhism is bad or the Chinese Buddhism is worse or the Japanese is still worse or the Vietnamese are peripheral Buddhism. I'm not saying that. Now, since we do not care for our own Buddhism, the rest of the world is not going to take you very seriously. And unfortunately, despite being the land of Buddha, we still have to rely on gurus uh, which are coming from across the border. Now, Either you believe in nation state, or, uh, I don't believe in uh, you know the, the borders as far as Buddhism is concerned. But since it's about politics, we make sure that whatever, uh, I mean, Mother Teresa came from outside, but she became Indian. That's all right, you know, that's another kind of a formulation. But then if you are still willing to accept the, the teachers, the teachings of Buddha or from Korea, Japan, you know, in good Delhi city, the full of Zen Buddhism, or, the, or there is a or there is another very variant of Buddhism which comes from Japan or from Chinese Falun Gong and many others. The modern Indian who feel very shy to go to a you know bhajan and uh, kirtan kind of uh, Hindu tradition uh, that you go to Punjab in Delhi, they are full of those jagrans. They feel very shy today to go to Hindu jagran. They rather go to a Japanese variety of uh, Buddhist teaching. So there are all these complex things which is happening 
what I'm trying to say is that this Himalayan Buddhism, which is our own Buddhism, has to be revived, not because that it will benefit Buddhism, but it will benefit India and benefit our country to protect our land. You know, both religion and land, as as he said, is so important in our context that uh, that that now. Uh, so the, the the mainstay of uh, Himalayan Buddhism is the is the Tantrayana, the Vajrayana Buddhism. There is an argument that uh, Padmasambhava was Odia. He was born in Sambalpur district. Uh, what we call it Shambhala is Shambhala is actually Sambalpur. Uh, he was the son of adopted son of King Indrabuddhi. And from where the entire Tantric Buddhism has spread, and spread all along the Himalayan. What you see in Tibet looks like Indian Buddhism, but it's not. Tibetans have their, innovated their own Buddhism by the century called Tsongkhapa, who came from Qinghai, the Amdo area, which is very close to Great Wall of China. He propounded, and that Buddhism was patronized by, uh, by, by the Qing dynasty, the Manchus, and the Mongols. The, uh, the, 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 the important part about this Tibetan Buddhism, which is of for the 14th century onwards, what we call it the Gelupa sect or the yellow sect of Buddhism. You know, the, the, the interesting thing that I must tell you is that when I came to Delhi uh, around, uh, was about eight years old or something like that, uh, people said that whole of uh, South Indian uh, with a little bit of uh, darkish skin are called madrasis. And later on, I realized by, you know, when I was 12 years old or 10 years old, that every South Indian is a madrasi. People say, no, no, he's a Malayali, he's, he's a Telugu, somebody said he's a Kannad or something like that. Similarly, for ordinary Indians, they look at us and they, they all think we are one people, they're lamas or something, Dalai Lama or Panchen Lama. No, no, Dalai Lama cannot go to Bhutan. Dalai Lama go to go to Nepal. Uh, you see, the, that kind of a Buddhism is a sinicized version of uh, Buddhism. What we have in the Himalaya is the Indian Buddhism. This fall line, this distinction is not very clear. Since it has been done by Americans for their own global politics, we buy these narratives. Whereas the British uh, strategic thinkers were very clear when they were making boundaries. Say, even if you say McMahon line or uh, Johnson line, or the Tibet India boundary or China India boundary, those definitions of boundaries were based on the four lines which are religious in nature. These are sectarian in nature. They were not willing to touch the Tibetan Buddhism as such. They were willing to only stick to the Himalayan Buddhism. Now, Himalayan Buddhism is more anglicized. Tibetan Buddhism is more sinicized. In a very crude form, I would say uh, the Tibetans would eat more noodles. The Himalayans would eat more rice or chapati. We would speak more English. They would speak something, you know, more scenic languages. So uh, during the 1890s century, when these boundaries were uh, thought about, these were thought about on the basis of the religious fault lines. I would say sectarian fault lines. And if you if you remove this distinct distinction and you say that this is one Buddhism, then you have a geopolitical problem. And otherwise, it looks very fine. And the whole of South India, Dravidian people cannot be put together in one boundary. Well, they look all same, but still you made states on the basis of some language or some history, some geography, Malayali. Kannad or something like that. So here, uh, e even in this region, there are distinctions. And uh, after British left, we had no scholarship. Whatever scholarship we had during the East India Company, uh, like uh, you know, uh, uh, there are those uh, old um, Indologists or Tibetologists that we produced uh, in the uh, uh, 18th century uh, by the British. In modern India, we don't have a single Tibetologist. Please give me one name. Uh, Raghu Vira was there uh, during the, he was funded by East India Company. Uh, then his son, um, uh, you know, Professor Lokesh Chandra, is, um, yes, he's, uh, he, he has a lot of collection of Buddhism text and all these things, but he is not, uh, our state has not used his knowledge 
in the policy making. He's there, or he's a scholar, he's still alive. He was a chairman of ICCR. But then, uh, you know, in the making of Indian foreign policy or in the making of Indian culture policy, these are not thought about. Uh, that's why I think uh, uh, we have a lot of problems. And uh, uh, that's why I think uh, this distinction, if you cannot make, uh, what, what has really happened was that this, uh, uh, Buddhism that uh, China purported uh, patronized the Buddhism from the 17th 17th uh, century onwards. Gilukpa sect of the Tibetan Buddhism was patronized and used as a vehicle, used as an instrument of power for the territorial expansion. Territorial expansion, you mean to say that the Chinese empire expanded into Siberia, into Mongolia, into Central Asia, into, into the Himalaya and other places through the use of Gelugpa sect, the yellow sect of Buddhism, to which the Dalai Lama was made the head, Panchen Lama and uh, Dalai Lama was the key figures of this Lama, uh, the, this sect. And they have been used by the Chinese as, as as uh, as as the instrument of Chinese empire, it 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 went on for four hundred years, from seventeen hundred and twentieth to nineteen twelve. Just as we were under the Mughal Empire, the Tibetans were also under the Qing Empire. Now, can you can you say that I cannot eat Mughalai chicken or Mughalai uh, curry? I'm used to some of those Mughal culture. Similarly, the Tibetans are used to some of the Chinese culture of the Qing Empire. Now, to, and they have been very comfortable. Now, today they have problem with Communist Party of China, but Communist Party of China is just an instrument. It doesn't mean they have a problem with the Chinese culture or Chinese Buddhism or Chinese history or anything like that. So uh, for us to look at all this issue in a very narrow prism of uh, of, of what is China and what is not China. Like, for example, we did not create the institution of Dalai Lama. Who created the institution of Dalai Lama? The Mongols and the Chinese made it. And today say that Dalai Lama should be reborn. Now tell me, was he born in Tibet, uh, in Bihar? Was he born in Karnataka before? Did we create this institution? No. Now, if you want to terminate this institution, you are throwing the baby out of the bathwater. The institution of the Dalai Lama and his legitimacy comes from Tibet, Mongolia, and China. Now, to say that he is an Indian, that would mean that you are undermining his own importance. So, in in politics, you have to be very very clear. Either we should, we should be clear about religion, or we should be clear about whether this religion should be used uh, for political purpose or not, and if you want to use it for what benefit. So, uh, the government of India. Uh, failed to understand this distinction between the Himalayan Buddhism and the Tibetan Buddhism, and they take it as one particular phenomena, uh, makes, it, uh, makes the entire policy uh, wrong, especially in the post-independence, this the mantle of the Himalayan Buddhism was given to the Americans for the CIA to operate in the China policy. And therefore, this politics has come into play, and uh, today the Himalayan Buddhism has become a contested geocultural phenomena or a geopolitical phenomena between India and China, and we are losing it partly because the religion is mixed with geography and geography is mixed with politics, and therefore we will have no control because actually you are promoting, and I, I heard that Ministry of Culture of India actually promoting Qing dynasty Buddhism. You are not promoting Padma Sambhava, you are not promoting Naropa, you are not promoting Tilupa, of Marpa, you are promoting a, a section of Buddhism which is sponsored by the Chinese. Now you got played into the Chinese hand. Now what you see in Galwan Valley or in Doklam in 2017 is because they are playing the Qing Dynasty Buddhist politics. Otherwise, why would the Chinese come to the Galwan Valley last year when they came? Did somebody ask the Chinese? Uh, did Galwan Valley belong to the father of Xi Jinping? Why do you come here in a place called uh, Galwan Valley or Pangong Lake or Dapsang Plain 
nobody asked this question to the Chinese, what is your local standard to come to this place? I'm sure he has a document. He has a document in his pocket said, look, I come here because of this. Now then, after a couple of uh, months, they say 1959 um, line should be acceptable for both, both of you and us. And uh, India is, uh, China is willing to settle the border on the basis of 1959. Now, what is 1959? What happened in 1959? 19, 1959, uh, the Chinese took over the Potala, the, the main uh, palace, the secretariat of the Tibetan government, of which Dalai Lama used to be the head, the Galdan Potang. Like we have Rashtrapati Bhavan, Tibet used to have Galdan Potang, the Lhasa Potala. They took over the entire Potala and they discovered all the blueprints of the Tibetan world. And there they found, okay, the Tibetan uh, lamas collected texts and, uh, you know, allegiance and all kind of respect and religious affiliation right deep into Ladakh. From this monastery to that monastery to this monastery, the whole network into Sikkim to Bhutan to Arunachal Pradesh. Now, on the basis of this Potala record, the, the, the Chinese now started claiming no, Chinese themselves do not have any claim in the Himalayas. They claim it on the basis of the Tibetan history. But unfortunately, the Tibetan themselves also claim the Himalayas. Now, we do not recognize this fact or we shy away from these things that when we got independence in 1947, we called up to the Tibetans, please come to Delhi, let's fix the boundary based on Shimla Agreement of uh, 1914, you know, the Shimla Treaty. They said, no, 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 uh, we will not come to Delhi for, for your independence celebration. First, you return all our territories that uh, British India controlled. It. Then they gave a list of, uh, you know, areas that are still controlled, uh, uh, fallen into Indian administration, which the British used to like Kalimpong, like Sikkim, like Ladakh, Arunachal Pradesh, they all considered. Now, before Mao Zedong said, my five fingers are in India, the Tibetan themselves said, Half the Tibet is in India. So the problem here is that you know, since we cannot uh, distinguish this uh, uh, variant on the basis of sectarian, the entire Himalayan uh, uh, Buddhism came under attack from the Tibetan version of Buddhism. The Bhutan resisted, Sikkim resisted, Ladakh resisted. Today we have 80% of Ladakh still the Himalayan Buddhism, Padma Sambhava's Buddhism, but we are you know, constantly put pressure by the Tibetan version of the sectarian, which is just not visible. We do not fight in open, like, like uh, say, Shia Sunni kind of a fight that we don't do it. But the undercurrents of conflict is between the Himalayan Buddhism. Oh, the, the pressure used to be on the Himalayan Buddhism because the Tibetan Buddhism used to be stronger in power because they were backed by the, uh, backed by the Chinese state till very recently, till the Communist Party came. Even today, uh, you know, the, the Chinese are very comfortable, say, for example, two lakh people or Tibetans sitting in India. It suits their interest. I'm not saying they are, they are Chinese agent or something, because the Chinese do not play this kind of an agent kind of a role. They use the instrument of influence. They know that Tibetan world is under China. So if the Tibetans are in India, well, the Tibet is already under the Chinese control, might as well have the Indian side of the Tibet also be brought into our influence, the area of influence. So I think the Mao Zedong was very clear in 1959-57, he let the Dalai Lama go to India, means that he was deliberately pushing the boundary lines beyond the, the, the their own boundary into the Himalayan side of the boundary. And then we very, very nicely, we, we fallen into this trap. And we could see after 60 years, the result is zero. And tomorrow, if His Holiness wants to go back to China, and already I see the, that the, the, the current Sikyong, the Lobsang Sangye, day before yesterday, was in the United States. He was received by State Department. He said, "My our fight with China is not with the people of China, not with the country of China, not with the Chinese nation. Our fight with China is only with those people and those policies which suppresses the rights of the Tibetan people. So now they have come down already. In fact, the new generation of people, you are in Shimla, there is a 
parliament uh, election that took place for the exile government uh, uh, you know the, the uh, administration uh, ministers uh, the contestation was finally between two people uh, one person and the other person uh, essentially what it means is that one person was trying to say that look uh, ultimate solution for tibet independence is a confrontation between india and china that's the only hope let Indians fight with the Chinese and let the Chinese fight with Indian. And in the process, we might get some benefit. That's one school of thought. The other school of thought who are contestant is saying that, no, we have tried this enough to put India against China and we have not reached anywhere. Let's do something else. Now, the new school of thought says, let's create trouble within Tibet. How to do it? They say, no, we cannot do it. Sitting outside, first be friendly with China. Let's talk to the Chinese, get inside uh, China, go back to Tibet and start creating problem. Now, this is a new school of thought which is coming up and they know that this has to be done because his holiness is not going to be there any, anymore. So uh, the politics is going to be changing very soon and every Tibetan is getting compromised uh, because they have to uh, survive in the post Dalai Lama scenario and everybody is contesting for to be in the good books of the Chinese. Uh, and that can be done only through Americans. The Americans are working behind the scene and you see that uh, they are still talking about uh, of negotiation between the Tibetans in exile and the Chinese government. Uh, the talks have uh, stopped since 2010. They want to resume it. Uh, and the and the Nancy Pelosi, who is now the Democrat, is pushing this line. And the Chinese have also stopped uh, vilifying these holiness Dalai Lama. They used to call him all kind of things. He's a snake, he's a wolf in the, he's a evil in the wolf or something like that. All kind of names that he used to call. Today, suddenly under the Xi Jinping leadership, they are not accusing the Tibetans and the his holiness Dalai Lama. And Dalai Lama also now stopped saying anything about China. And uh, you must uh, make sure that uh, when the United States is talking about all these things, they are only talking about their own interests. Uh, a for in their domestic United States politics versus the the human rights and they you know they they take these normative issues very seriously human rights democracy liberty and all these things which which is not part of our uh, discourse but uh, in the American political discourse these are very important and Tibet becomes a very important to highlight the how United States value human rights now except in Burma today there are no issues of human rights people say okay now the Xinjiang has come up. Now, the Xinjiang has come up a more in a potent way than the Tibetan issue because Xinjiang is a Muslim. They are not Buddhist. Now, Tibetans are not clubbed as terrorists. There is no issue of terrorism in Tibet. Terrorism is confined to Xinjiang. And the Chinese have, you know, Islamophobia, you know, all kind of this problem makes Xinjiang far more interesting for the Americans. Now, next next agenda is going to be Xinjiang, not Tibet. With Tibet, even if they don't have political dialogue, they have a dialogue on the basis of metaphysics, religion, quantum physics, and all kinds of things, uh, you know, deep philosophical issues of, of, of our Lokete Shivarya or many other uh, uh, Buddhist doctrine. They are, there are no differences between the Chinese and the Tibetan Buddhism. So they accept it. The only difference between the Tibetan and the Chinese Buddhism is that Tibetan Buddhism, like Hinduism, has got hierarchy. Like we have caste system, Brahminical order. The Tibetan Buddhism has got a Rinpoche order. There are class of lamas, the high lamas, low lamas, or ordinary lamas. Whereas in Chinese Buddhism, there is no hierarchy. Every Buddhist is the same Buddhist, like communism. So now today, in the current context, even the Chinese have started accepting the Tibetan hierarchy of Buddhism, and they are very uh, uh, comfortable. What I'm trying to highlight on the Indian uh, uh, Himalayan Buddhism is that uh, while we have been only emphasizing on countering China through military aspect of it, so the military dimension of China threat in the Himalaya is very well known. It is a, it is a part of our security discourse. Every strategic dialogue, every strategic security issues, seminars, conferences, is all about PLA versus Indian, uh, Indian, uh, Indian uh, Army, our preparedness, our infrastructure, connectivity, bridges, roads in Himachal Pradesh, 
in Ladakh, in Jammu and Kashmir, in Arunachal. That's part of our discourse. But Chinese have launched a long ago a non-military nature of the problem. It's a shadowy pattern that we cannot really make out. I'm not saying that this, these lamas who have come from across the border into our border are linked to CPEC per se, but it, it cannot be uh, seen in that context. But the impact of what they have done, you do not have a single person from Himachal Pradesh going across the border and staying there for, for more than a month in the, in the Kailash Mansarwar area. Whereas we have 20,000 Tibetans coming every year through the Nepal into India, and uh, we think you know they're anti-China. Surely they are anti-China, but this is not how the Chinese are looking at it. They are looking at it, it's called, it's called reverse strategic depth. Reverse strategic depth means, you heard about strategic depth. Strategic depth was done during the uh, end of the Cold War, uh, when the United States uh, sponsored the jihadi uh, you know, movement against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. What happened was the Soviet army came in Afghanistan, all the, the, the mujahids came into Pakistan, into frontier areas in Quetta, in many other places in uh, Pakistan, and they were trained into guerrilla force, were trained into mujahideens, they were organized, given Kalashnikov, AK-47, Stinger missiles, trained by CIA, Saudi intelligence, and Pakistanis, ISI, for donkey years. In the, uh, the, the, in the frontier areas of Pakistan. And they were sent back to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviet Union. And they were successful in that. Now, in this case, in the Himalayan case, when the Tibetans came here on the same reasons, uh, when the, uh, the Americans uh, supported the Tibetans to come to India, we could not convert them into a guerrilla force to be trained, weaponized, and sent back into Tibet to fight against the Chinese. We didn't do that. So now 60 years passed, even the Chinese understood that Indians have no such policies to train the Tibetans into guerrilla force and then send them back to Tibet and create problem within Tibet. Well, we tried a little bit here and there, but it failed. The Americans wanted up that project in Mustang, Mustang uh, operation in 1970s when the Sino-US relationship improved. They stopped all this kind of uh, operation inside Tibet. You know, this uh, uh, in the uh, you know, Kangotri and all this, uh, we had many other uh, uh, operations uh, happening. Those, uh, all of these things have now stopped. So uh, what has happened is that Chinese say, no, okay, if that is the case, then let's have the reverse strategic depth. Whosoever has gone to uh, India, treat them as our own people. I'm not saying as colonists, but I think uh, they it suits their purpose that if even if they're spreading the Tibetan form of Buddhism in Himachal Pradesh, in Shimla, into Masuri, to where Situ Rinpoche is there, or to, to, to or Dharamshala, or in, in Masuri, in Kalimpong, in uh, all the British hill stations that are settled. Yeah, why not? It's very good. It's good for the motherland of China. Ultimately, the epicenter of Tibetan Buddhism is still controlled by the Chinese, and they have no problem in this. So this complexity of Indian Buddhism has changed in the last four decades because of Indian own foolish and wrong assumption that they will win something, some, some great game we are going to win by doing this. As a result, the, the Himalayan Buddhism complexity has completely transformed and you cannot even save it. It's already sucked into something else and the distinction has become very blurred. Even in the international discourse, a, even the Hollywood movies have fantasized, romanticized Tibetan Buddhism with Himalaya. Very, very difficult to segregate now today. There are a lot of Hollywood actors and actresses and singers, pop singers are, are part of this process of, uh, they made it into Shangri-La and Last Horizon. A lot of Hollywood movies have been made and uh, it's, it's become a very international thing now. Uh, obviously now it's coming down uh, uh, even the Hollywood is not uh, doing very well. Uh, Tibet-centric Hollywood is not doing well because, because the Chinese are putting a lot of pressure in the Hollywood industry. They are uh, spending a lot of money 
uh, to kill those projects which tries to highlight this kind of tantric Shangri La type of uh, you know uh, concept and movies which are very very mystical uh, movies that used to have in the past in the 80s. Now the problem here is that the the Himalaya has already become in a contestation zone between the Americans and the Chinese, and I know for the very fact that in the State Department. They, their way of looking at Tibet is different from the way we look at the Tibet. The Americans also say yes, Tibet needs to be liberated from China, but Tibet also needs to be liberated from India. While being a democracy, they don't make it very clear that we also hold Tibet. For example, they consider me to be a Tibetan, the Americans. And when they fund the Tibetan government in Dharamshala, they, their program also includes Sikkim, Bhutan, they don't entertain the Tibetans. They, nobody can go to uh, Bhutan. Uh, Nepal uh, in, doesn't eat it. Wherever Indian territory is there, like Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim, and Ladakh, uh, the Americans fund project in the Tibetan scheme of things. And uh, this $9 million has been spent to strengthen the Tibetan language culture. Now, where would they strengthen the Tibetan culture and language? They will make me more Tibetanized. Now, mind you, I'm a very good Urdu speaking, Hindi speaking, and Ladakhi Indian. Till a couple of years ago, a decades ago, I used to speak you know, very fluent Urdu. Today, my children do not speak Urdu or Hindi. They speak good Tibetan. Now, how does Indian state benefit by making me more Tibetanized? If His Holiness says that let's all go back to China, should they also go to China? Because I don't know this. Uh, uh, to me, it's okay. I can go to China or Tibet or anything. Doesn't matter. I don't look like a Punjabi or a Tamilian. A Tamilian. But how does Indian Indians benefit by making me Tibetan? Let me be a Ladakhi which was controlled by Zorawar Singh or Hari Singh or Dogra or um, the, the, the Maharaja Ranjit, we were linked with Maharaja Ranjit's history, you know, part of Punjab and then part of Ogra Raja and Kashmir Raja. And uh, we were good, okay, we paid tribute to to Mughal dynasty, to the, in Lahore Darbar, in the Kashmir Darbar, but suddenly we become more loyal to the leaders who are on the, across the border. I have no problem with those people coming from across the border. I respect them, but so today my leaders are, from across the border. My leaders are not coming from Punjab. I have no regards for any leaders, say in Lahore, in Punjab, or Amritsar, or in Jammu, or Srinagar. In fact, I accuse them. I accuse the Kashmiris for, for uh, uh, denying my, my rights. And suddenly now I, I look toward that side. So I find here problems in the Indian state to understand those dynamics that are uh, taking place uh, in the, in the now, the British time, the British policy makers, whether it was young husband, whether it was Lord Curzon, whether it was all kind of uh, the British, uh, British bureaucrats, very, very clear. He said, look, hold on to the Himalayans. How do you hold on to the Himalayans? Through the Buddhism. The moment you cross the Himalayan Buddhism and venture into something else, you will have diminishing return. That's why for the Lord Curzon crossing Himalaya, Himalaya and going into the proper Tibet, then you are your your empire, your colonial strength is going to come down. You know, they used to go by cost benefit analysis. And they said, no, it's not sustainable. Not only you will not be able to control Tibet, you will lose Indian Himalayan also. So the frontier boundary, the boundary lines, the Indian frontiers were just based on the Indian Buddhist Himalayas rather than based on the Tibetan Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism is a subject which was imposed on us by the Americans, and we have taken it very, very comfortably. Uh, and the British were very clear. The British were very clear. They created buffer zones. Whenever they found the distinction cannot be made, they created buffer zones. They call it inner Tibet, outer Tibet, outer boundary, inner boundary. Why they did the, uh, Why did they do it? They did it because. Sometimes where to go from the Himalayas and where it Tibet starts. You know, I have read books, old books, where the, the, our travelers, our pilgrimage going to Mount Kailash, 
they actually could not make out where uh, India ended and where Tibet started. It's the same terrain, same spiritual terrain. But British were more worried about the security of the states, so they created buffer areas. That's why even today the boundaries can be defined between India and China. Uh, uh, okay, this is little like here, little like here. So even today, after 70 years, we could not negotiate with the Chinese a proper boundary between two of us. Nehru failed. Nehru had two dilemma. Nehru, uh, see, when in the fifties, uh, when the boundary making problem started in the fifties, uh, say uh, 1951-52, Nehru had two choice on the boundary issue. Either he should accept the old customary boundary between Tibet and India, which means in the western sector there was a treaty between Tibet and Ladakh of uh, 1684. Now that boundary is very funny. That boundary is based on customs and rituals and trade and other things. So in the Sikkim, there is a Sikkim Anglo uh, Anglo Sikkim uh, Sikkim Tibet Convention of 1897. During the Doklam debate, this whole issue came up. And then in Bhutan, they have a treaty with uh, Tibet. Nepal has a treaty with Tibet. Arunachal has a treaty with uh, Tibet. So. Nehru had one option to do uh, to opt for this this uh, this formula of accepting Tibetan Indian uh, Himalayan boundary, but he saw that we were losing more territory to Tibet rather than we are gaining from Tibet. So the other option he used was the British definition of you know MacMahon line, which is forward policy, the Chris line, the mountain going beyond the uh, high Himalayas. So uh, then he said, look, uh, if he if he accepted the traditional boundaries, he was losing more territory. If we are using the British definition of the boundary, he have he was accused of being a, a running dog of the imperialist power. I mean, he was also like imperial British Empire who said, oh, I have a forward strategy like Macmahon line, Johnson line. So the Chinese using Nehru for being like a British. Whereas if he had accepted the old uh, Tibet-India uh, boundary, uh, we were losing e even up to Shimla, where, wherever you are sit you know, sitting, the Tibetans used to control right up to Shimla itself at one point of time. And Tibetans were claiming. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very sure because, it's, you know, don't go by our way of thinking. Don't go by British way of thinking, Western way of thinking. If the His Holiness Dalai Lama, which is the 14th Dalai Lama, stayed for 60 or 70 years in Dharamshala, in the next history, in the 22nd century, Chinese scholars are going to say, since the 14 Dalai Lama stayed in Dharamshala, that's a part of Tibet. That's going to be part of China. This is how they claim Arunachal Pradesh as, because the sixth Dalai Lama was born in Tawang. On the basis of that, say Tawang is part of China. Why? Because the sixth Dalai Lama was born in China. Now the birth of a Dalai Lama is not just some metaphysical or some heavenly creation. Birth of a from, uh, Dalai Lama is designed to capture more territories. Sometimes a Dalai Lama is born in, in Mongolia. Sometimes a Dalai Lama is born in some other territory. So it was designed by the Qing Empire or the Manchu court. Okay, if you want to expand the empire into that territory, don't send forces, don't send troops. Let the Dalai Lama be born there, and naturally that area will fall into our realm, our sphere of influence, because the epicenter is is in in Peking, Peking court, and uh, they were the pattern, they were the they were the uh, actual you know holder of the truth, whether it is Manchuria, Mongolia, or Tibet, or all these things. So if if they are coming to the Himalayas today, the PLA is coming there. You know, it is not PLA's land. It's not Han land, it's the Tibetan land. So where, where is that if you have a strategy, uh, the counter strategy, I'm quite okay, fine, let's Tibet be independent. But we don't have that uh, policy. Uh, again, in the, in the process, we have a wishy-washy policy. In that policy, we stand to lose. And whatever we may do, even after 30 years, we'll be losing territory. And these territories are being, we are going to lose it on the basis of Tibetan history. And a history which is we, we ourselves promote. And I, I heard that in the Ministry of Culture of the Government of India, there are annual publication which talks about you know, how, uh, uh, how the father of the Indian uh, Army called General Zoravar Singh, the Dogra General Zoravar Singh, was beheaded by Tibetans 
uh, in in 1840 in the Takla in uh, you know in, in right now in Tibet. Uh, these are written by all all people in the culture different history written by Tibetans but published by Indians. Indians are so naive they don't read the, what they publish. <laughs> and uh, I, I find it very strange that uh, when they send uh, cultural troupe to France or Germany, they project the, the, the Manchu version of Buddhism, they display on the international platform that it is Indian. So you are actually only pr propagating and strengthening the, the Chinese claim over the Himalayas rather than strengthening. Nobody talks about the icons of the Himalayas. Have we ever talked in the last? 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years about something. Now, if you actually have a claim over Ladakh, in the, if the Indian nation has any right to claim over Ladakh, it's mainly because of Dogra Rajas or the Sikh kings. But how many times do we talk? We talk more about Dalai Lama, but Dalai Lama is not uh, the, 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 you know, if you say Dalai Lama is Himalaya, then you stand to lose. You say Zorawar Singh is Himalaya, uh, Ranjit Singh is Himalaya, or many other icons. Maybe in the Sikkim sector, there are other issues. In Nepal, there are, but we instead promote the foreign icons. All our icons are actually foreigners. Even in Bollywood, our heroes are uh, they're coming from Afghanistan or somewhere in Peshawar. They are our heroes. Mother Teresa is a foreigner. The problem with this, you know, we like worshipping foreigners. And uh, um, uh, ignorance leads to loss of territories, and we are the victim of this mindset. If we in Ladakh lose, despite being, being being an Indian, being a loyal Indian, these kind of mindsets are imposed. Okay, there is a hero you must worship. Obviously, we will worship anybody who is imposed on us because uh, if I say, uh, but why don't you say this thing to the Bhutanese? Tell the Bhutanese. Bhutanese are very clear. Bhutan exist vis-a-vis -vis Tibet. Okay. Either there is a Bhutan or there is a Tibet. So they said, no, Bhutan is Bhutan. If there is no Bhutan, then we are all Tibetan. So they are very, very clear about a, a Bhutanese is more comfortable with China. Chinese don't pose any threat to Bhutan, but a, a Tibetan poses a threat, existential threat to Bhutan. That is why they are very, very nuanced. During Doklam period, they were keeping quiet. But the Indians, out of ignorance, you are threatening Bhutan by propagating something. You know, whenever His Holiness goes to Tawang, the Bhutanese feel nervous. Because no Bhutan, the threat is from the Tibetans, not from the Chinese. Have you ever thought about this? To me, in dark, uh, my threat is not from China. My threat to me is from Tibet. Historically, we fought wars with Tibet, not with China. But the Indian state patronized people who threaten us. So this aspect, you need to understand. These are you know, complex issues. And that's why your frontier policy, your boundary policies, your China policy go wrong. You know, completely go haywire. Because the specificity are not known to us. Uh, in the process, I think uh, we will continue to lose territories. And military is not sufficient. You deploy one division, one corps, or whatever mechanized or mountain divisions in the in the Himalayas. This is not going to deter China because the Chinese are playing a different game altogether. And uh, this is going to uh, continue. And uh, uh, Ch uh, the Chinese are very well uh, harnessing the different resources for steering the Himalayan game in their favor. And if tomorrow the 15th Dalai Lama is born in Namshala or Shimla or Suri somewhere, Chinese will be very happy because this is how they play the game. It's a different game than we than what we understand the game should be. And uh, I think this is uh, going to be a very, very complex phenomena. And simply having a military answer to uh, all these issues is not sufficient. We have to be able to you know, uh, create a lot of other means non-military means to confront with these issues. And, and more and more, I think we are playing into the Chinese uh, game. Uh, and the Chinese may be laughing. Once I was in Shanghai, I was talking to uh, uh, Chinese professors. They were saying, look, uh, you know, doing good work for the motherland. I said, how? What do you mean? 
no, 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 no. You see, this, this is like this, this is like that. So they, they think that, you know, they're not making too much noise. Uh, imagine, imagine if we, if we, if we, uh, some uh, Sikh or Khalistanis go to Tibet or China and they start creating activities there, we will be very upset. But the Chinese are not upset about the, uh, the Tibetan activities in India. They're very comfortable. In, in fact, in some places in the Himalayas, you actually, um, uh, they have outnumbered. In Ladakh, I would tell you that uh, out of, say, 50 monasteries, the key monasteries that we have, there are no Ladakhis who are the heads of these monasteries. They're all been overtaken by Tibetan lamas. Now, I cannot, I do not have any technology to understand their mind and heart. They're, since they are not sons of the soil, I have no, uh, I have no mechanism to find out that they are pro-Indians or that they are Ladakhis or they are uh, Buddhists can be a kawa. Uh, Chinese are also Buddhists. That, that way I cannot uh, say that Chinese are not Buddhist. Historically, I still believe that Chinese are Buddhist. Communism, Chinese Communist Party is just a facade. Let me tell you. It's a way to keep the Chinese state together. It's a bureaucratic structure they kept it. But inside, whenever Xi Jinping says that India and China has a mutual interest, mutual dialogue, mutual discussion, he's actually talking Buddhist language. We do not understand. He's using our language to us. We do not try to understand. And we say, oh, this is a communist language. It's not communist language. He said mutual dialogue, mutual harmony, you know, uh, Cooperation is good for Asia, for India, good for China. So they're very smart people. And don't think that, you know, uh, uh, Buddhism has no role to play. Buddhism is uh, even in the Ming dynasty or Yuan dynasty, uh, uh, you know, Kali Devi, that Bengali form of uh, tantric Hinduistic uh, uh, doctrine was adopted by the uh, Tibetans. Uh, she is called Pandal Lamo in Tibetans. And the Chinese heard that the Tibetans got hold of a, a deity from India who is very dreadful, very powerful, who can destroy a lot of enemies and adversaries. So in the Ming Dynasty in the 12th century, uh, the Kali Devi was made a part of the military doctrine of the Ming Dynasty. It's only in, 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 in the uh, in, later on when the Mongol Empire adopted, you know, the, 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 the call it Mahakal. Uh, Hakal is you uh, uh, in Ujjain or somewhere. That version the Tibetan also adopted. And the Chinese said, "What is the utility of Mahakal?" They said, oh, "Mahakal is a little bit more wider, and it can also destroy the enemies, so to bridges and through karmic you know, tantric method of destruction." So the Chinese adopted uh, in their uh, military doctrines various uh, forms of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and it is. Very difficult to distinguish. For example, Kala Chakra Tantra, the Wheel of Time, Kala Chakra Tantra, which is actually a Nalanda creation, uh, the tantric uh, exercise. Uh, earlier, it used to be performed. In India, I don't know, since the 8th century, there was any Kala Chakra performance by any Indian uh, philosopher in India or any Bengali or Uriya um, Acharyas who performed Kala Chakra in India. But the Tibetans performed in the court of Chinese empire all the time, not to the people of China, but to the emperors of China, to the in the to the royal families of China. It's only in Qing dynasty said they said no, this Kalkra Tantra can be a very useful tool to expand Chinese empire. So it's only through the Kalachakra Tantra the Chinese empire expanded. Today, when when we the Americans and us accuse the Chinese for being expansionist. What does it mean? Chinese are following the tantric route, wherever they perform Kal Chakra Tantra, they're coming. Now, His Holiness Dalai Lama, being in India, he rightly says, I have performed Kal Chakra Tantra in Ladakh. I have been to uh, Ladakh for 23 times. Now, Indian states do not understand what does it mean. It means that he has made Ladakh more, even if it was less Tibetanized before, more Urduized or Persianized or mobilized or it was under the Kashmiri Sikh Punjabi influence. Today, through Kala Chakra, he has purified this area and made again a part of Tibet. 
Now, I have no problem the metaphysical point of view, whether I'm a chakra tantra or the Chinese variety or the Tibetan variety or the Nalanda variety. But the use of this Kal Chakra Tantra for geopolitics. And when the Chinese do not accept just geopolitics like that, every geopolitical or religious phenomena is then converted into military action. As they establish a relationship with, the, uh, with, with people, with monasteries, and it is followed by a military action. That's the danger we need to see. And say that, therefore, Buddhism doesn't pose a threat to us is also quite tricky. It's only the pale military is, uh, is a threat to us. Is you know that's how we understand. It. But no, Chinese have a different yardstick. They they mix the religion, Buddhism, Trayana, whatever you know, uh, and wherever there is a vacuum. For example, uh, Nepal is a vacuum that we have left. We 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 keep uh, our own uh, uh, you know the the Vishnu avatar, uh, the, the the king of Nepal was a Trigun, Tribuna Raja, was the uh, Vishnu, the last uh, symbol of Vishnu. We ourselves have destroyed it. And instead, we promoted secularism or Maoism or whatever that be, multi-party democracy. How do we get it? Now, Chinese are going to grab it. He is now sucked into the Chinese debate through Hinduism, Buddhism. Now, can you imagine, if you say the Dalai Lama is born in, in India, Tomorrow, the Chinese are going to say the Kamrup Raja of Assam is born in Yunnan district. Or, or they say uh, Tribuna Raja of, uh, of, of Nepal is reborn, taken a reincarnation in Lhasa. Now, then, you know, uh, Prime Minister Oli already has said that uh, Lord Rama is born in, uh, in Nepal. So, so it's a very complex thing, and we have to play this thing very carefully with it with due scholarly understanding, rather than making intelligence bureau or RNAW to make uh, uh, you know, these policies based on some short things. You know. If you go by CIA understanding of this thing, CIA you know, can use you and dump you also tomorrow. They're already doing it. Uh, we can see now that they have come into the Indian Ocean in our uh, EEZ. They're saying it's international water. Day before yesterday, said India is a currency manipulator, and uh, they are already accusing us on many other issues. That tomorrow they might uh, rake up Kashmir issue again on human rights and other things. We should have our own understanding rather than going by CIA definition of. They say they have a China-centric policy, but in in India, the Americans are staying very far away. We have to deal with this Asian content in in, in our way. Simply cannot uh, app the. The, 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 the American formula of understanding Asia, we should have our own resources and strength to understand, to deal with the Chinese threat. Whatever threat the Chinese pose to us, we have the capabilities. So I think I will end here. Any question that you have, uh, that's the politics of Buddhism. Buddhism per se is a very dangerous to, actually, I don't suggest anyone. In India, you know, there are a couple of uh, Buddhist uh, activities. A, it is done by culture ministry, which do with some culture, monastery, paintings, and all that thing. The other is some universities are doing under UGC. They're teaching some philosophy, this, 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 this thing. The other is done by intelligence agencies who are saying that Buddhism must be used to counter China. And Dharamshala is one part of that project, uh, edited by Americans' support. Now, if you're using... <laughs> Uh, you know, Buddhism is a, is a, is a geopolitical card, then you should be very careful. You should be well, well uh, equipped to deal with that because how many devotional Buddhists are there in India? We all respect Buddha. I was in uh, Hyderabad last year. At the airport at the Hyderabad, there was a massage center, foot massage center. Every massage uh, bed, there is a little statue of Buddha kept on every bed. As if, you know, the lady who is massaging you, you feel you are in a nirvana state. That's the respect of Buddhism in India. We have made Buddha into a cartoon, a, 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 a decoration piece. Everybody keeps a Buddha near the table or near the door. If you go to rich families in Delhi, you know, this Indian people in Vasant Vihar or in Greta Kailash, they will keep Buddha in the bathroom also. It's a fashionable because, oh, it just gives you peace. You know, like Buddha whiskey, Buddha... Secret. Uh, no, 
But in China, while we feel that China is a Communist Party, deep inside, even the Communist Party uh, uh, get its strength from the grassroots, which are Buddhist. In the villages, the ordinary people are Buddhist, who then support the Communist Party. You ask Professor Lokesh Chandra, the strength of Communist Party of China is derived from the Buddhistic. I have been to many parts of China and say, Indo, Indo, I mean, this fellow has come from India. They come and touch my feet. Or this fellow has come from the land of my God. Now, what we hear from the media is one thing. What you actually go to China, sit with the ordinary people, they have a different notion about China. Now, despite what has happened in 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 the Galwan or Pangong Pangong with, with with the with the military stand of last year, China is still not willing to punish us in the manner which China has done to Australia. And they are not willing to do that. Beyond a point, Chinese will not become our enemy because they, they it's not possible for ordinary Chinese to treat us as enemy because he says no, we were barbaric. We were taught wisdom and knowledge and spiritualism by the Indians. They treat us as guru, but if you don't want to be a guru of them, then uh, it's our problem. We, they used to worship us, used to be our slaves. For 2,000 years, we have dominated them through psychology, through mind. We gave them, we gave them ethics, we gave them philosophy. They were barbarians, you know, they were used to eat animals. Today, China is enlightened. They openly say that, you know, uh, without Buddha, we would have, we would have been orphans. And uh, we accept Buddha because Buddha was homeless. But India, uh, Buddha, Buddha has no place in India. So we adopted Buddha. Buddha would have been homeless without China, but China would have been orphaned without Buddha. That's the, the language you find in many temples. Uh, all these things are... Uh, uh, So uh, I think I'll stop here. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. That was a riveting, provocative, fascinating, deeply informative, I think completely mind-shifting kind of talk. It uh, challenged so many of our assumptions and showed us up to be inadequate on so many fronts. I just wanted to start with a bit of good news. You're probably uh, in Ladakh. You may not have heard, but the U.S. has... Uh, allowed uh, us to, you know, uh, use their raw material. A statement from the White House said that uh, just as India sent assistance to the United States, the United States is determined to help India in its time of need. So, uh, and apparently Mr. Rajit Doval spoke to his counterpart, Jake Sullivan over the telephone to move matters. But anyhow, that's one part of it. The other interesting part is, uh, uh, by the logic uh, of, uh, uh, you know, using, as it were, uh, the Dalai Lama's, next Dalai Lama's birth, some say he'll be born in the United States, which will mean that China will say that that is a part of Tibet too. But uh, I think your point is really well taken. When I visited Bhutan for the first time, I realized that the Drukpa, you know, uh, sect uh, was the basis, basis of a, uh, independent nation, the Thunder Dragon nation. And everywhere you see Druk, Druk elements, Druk, uh, you know, even jams and squashes. And then I started reading and then I realized that way back, Nangwang Namgyal, I think in the 17th century, 1637 or so, uh, wanted to establish an independent state. And after that, uh, Tibet, with the help of China invaded that area many times, including, I mean, the Five Fingers is very old. They wanted to take over uh, what we have today, Tawang, Sikkim, Bhutan, and they were resisted. And that's how these areas remain relatively independent. So you're absolutely right. We have to do our uh, you know, research. We have to learn our history properly. You're also absolutely right about Zoravar Singh uh, and how we've forgotten somebody who took our, you know, borders right up to Tibet. In fact, I think he he briefly, if I'm not mistaken, even went up to Lhasa and then was was pushed back. So we have uh, uh, one comment and question. The others are silent, but 
इट सज दट सर्वथा नई और अनोखी आंखें खोलने वाली जानकारियां दिस इज फ्रॉम प्रोफेसर माधव हाडा व्याख्यान व्याख्यान के लिए बधाई क्या दलाई लामा के प्रति भारतीय नीति में परिवर्तन की जरूरत है दिस इज द क्वेश्चन सर आई थिंक इन दिन नाइनटीन हिंदी में बोलू कि इंग्लिश में बोलू जी वॉट एवर यू लाइक वॉट एवर इट्स वॉट एवर यूर कंफर्टेबल विद 1959 when his holiness dalai lama came here nehru resisted he said no i don't want to have any problem with china please let him in fact he came couple of years before 1959 he came in 19 uh, i think uh, 55 he came on the 2050th anniversary of lord buddha's parinirvana he and panchen lama came with a statue of hun sang a relic of hun sent by mao zedong they represented china both of them panchala and there was a professor called ram rahul have you ever heard professor ram rahul he was a professor in jnu uh, of the inner asian studies or something like that himalayan studies so nehru consulted uh, ram rahul in 1955 i studied under him initially in 1980s uh, when he was still with the school of international studies he has written in his book that uh, nehru consulted him whether government of india should let the dalai lama stay in india uh, uh, ram rahul suggested to nehru no let him go back why to create problem we are not in a position to uh, confront with china at that stage it's a very sensitive matter let him go 1959 when he came again because of the chinese uh, um, taking over of lhasa uh, when the cia you know rescued him from lhasa to india nehru was reluctant and uh, 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 you see the 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 when his holiness the first choice was to go to burma you know in burma in uh, myanmar today there are certain areas which are tibetan speaking areas the tao pao sorry pao area it's in the north of burma he wanted to go there but the burmese that time was uh, negotiating with the chinese on the boundary issues in 1959 they finally they settled in 1961 uh, burma china boundary same on the mcmahon line principle so unu was that the prime minister unu refused to entertain the lai lama's request so then he says no then he says that i will go to tawang tawang is part of tibet actually we india used to hold tawang but from the tibetan conception tawang was there one of their cities of tibet so a, one, his oracle nechung see the lai lama does whatever he do, does he consults a oracle you know the devi whatever the get spirit so that nechung oracle draw a line on a paper a mountain like this 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 then and he directed dalai lama to move towards tawang this he came he came to tawang and it stay he thought there but somehow it some sense prevails the government of india got him straight to 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 masuri we never allowed him to stay in tawang that much sense the indian state had if he had continued to stay in tawang that would have been established that arunachal pradesh is part of tibet and i think that time better bureaucrats i think uh, you know the uh, what was it the defense minister that time and foreign secretary this time said no, don't let him stay in arunachal pradesh bring him back to delhi so he was brought to delhi and then was resettled in 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 in, in, in masuri and then later on to dharamshala uh, that that sensitivity was there but then i think the uh, that time the swaraj party in uh, india uh, who was uh, like the Jan, there was no jansangi party there was no bjp that time the swaraj party uh, become hysterical hysterical says that communist china must be defeated and the dalai lama was received like a phoenix and mao zedong's photograph the choi lai photograph consulate in bombay was smashed and destroyed and nehru could not do anything but to accept him and once we accept him as a guest but the government of india made him very clear that he will not indulge in any political activities he will be a guest and will remain as a guest and we pledge to look after his him and his people in tibet now the problem is in between the americans you know this uh, that was a part of the cold war americans were using tibet to break up china and even they continue to do so they were able to do with the soviet union with the afghans 
but they, they could not do to China with the help of the Tibetans because the Tibetans did not pick up the Kalashnikov guns. Now, in the current context, I think unless you have the clear it's not going to be a very, you know, the utility of Tibet in the last 60 years in my diplomacy, uh, my, my career in the diplomacy is that we could hardly use it. For example, if I say Prime Minister Oli is our asset, or President Ghani in Afghanistan is India's asset, or you can say Sheikh Hasina is my real card, or you can say that you know somebody in Sri Lanka, Prime Minister, is my asset against China. So while I understand with Sheikh Hasina we can deal and we can do diplomacy and practical aspect of our relationship with Bangladesh keeps on happening. In 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 uh, Nepal, uh, you can keep on having either with Nepali Congress or, or or the Oli or Prachanda or whatever like that. With Afghanistan, we can have with Karzai or 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 anything like that. Now, if you think Dalai Lama is a strategic card, then please tell me when did we use it? Now, the only point that we could have used it, say, for example, last year, while the PLA was coming into our territory deep inside and creating problem, his holiness could have, if he did not do it or he, he was not willing to do it, at least some of his people could have created problem for China within Tibet. There could have been series of uprising within China, say in Lhasa, or in many cities of Tibet uh, against the Chinese. And we, 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 the, then our, 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 uh, our position would have been strengthened. But nothing that sort of a thing happened. Tibetans don't stand up for anything. In fact, when we were wanted to deal with Tibet during young husband time in 1904, uh, young husband was a British commissioner, went from Kalimpong to Lhasa to set up a telegraphic line. We were told that the enemies of Tibet, the India was invading. So then, then away, the, the previous Dalai Lama ran to, 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 to Mongolia. So um, whenever the, the, you know, Tibet, they took the shelter under the Chinese. When the, the Chinese came to Tibet, they took shelter under us. So it's very unique uh, landlocked kind of a syndrome they have. Uh, very difficult to do with the, uh, deal with the Tibetans. Today, they are not in a position to say that Tawang and Ladakh is not part of Tibet. They are not in a position to say that. They have no local stand there. But if they are tomorrow, they are independent, they will very claim Arunachal Pradesh, Ladakh, Sikkim, and Bhutan, whatever they want to claim. And Americans will make sure that they will claim from us. Peace, Professor P. Stoplin is a Tibetan. He must be back to Tibet. Can you... <laughs> Can you, uh, this kind of scenario could happen. Good. Americans will make sure this will happen. And look, you cannot control Mr. Oli. Prime Minister Oli, Oli says, give back my territory uh, from Kalapani or uh, Lipu Lake or whatever that uh, in the Gadwal area, the Nepalese are claiming uh, he's a Hindu uh, leader, a Nepali leader, is not willing to give any compromise, uh, compromise with you on the territory with India. How do we expect the Dalai Lama to compromise on his territory with us? It's a fantasy that we, we cultivate in our mind. And nothing that sort of is going to happen. Today, they are not to say once they go back to Tibet and if they have some any kind of autonomy or independence, Chinese will force them to say that. Chinese are telling the Nepalese also to say that. You think they are not going to tell the Tibetans? Either we should have the ability to liberate Tibet. Okay, let's liberate Tibet like we did with Bangladesh. And then what? With Bangladesh, we, you, we spent enormous energy, enormous, eno enormous resources to keep our relationship intact. It's a very tricky relationship. Now you have an independent Tibet, then it's another tricky deal. And it's not going to be easy for us. It's the highest land on the earth and the Americans and all sorts of powers are going to be sitting in Lhasa on the head of us. And then say sitting in Lhasa, Next should be Ulfa, next should be Tawang, next should be Ladakh. So the Americans are not going to sit quiet. And yet, just yesterday, I said in, uh, read a new uh, paper which came from America. The next corridor, now the Americans are leaving Afghanistan, uh, exit from Afghanistan, but they're going to re-enter our region in a different way. And the new way they are saying is that Sindh and Tibet. Have you ever imagined Sindh and Tibet? is in Pakistan, Karachi, you know, the government. 
has followed the Indus route, the Karachi route. And through the Indus route, you go towards Punjab and then go to Pakistan occupied Kashmir, go to Ladakh, and the actual origin of Indus is in Tibet. That's a new strategic corridor, they are saying, to squeeze China. Squeezing China is fine that in between they also want to squeeze India. So the Americans have a different, different ideas, project, they keep coming up. Uh, so they, they, they are fantastic people. They're sitting in Pentagon. They can imagine a lot of geostrategic ideas. But in the process, we will be disturbed. And uh, this is what I feel that uh, I would not suggest that the 15th Dalai Lama, we should interfere. Let the Tibetan decide where they want to be bombed, where he wants to bomb. But Americans are telling us to play a role uh, to, for the next birth of the Tibetans. And actually, who is going to give legitimacy to the next uh, 15 Dalai Lama, who RNAW is going to give that, uh, or our Minister External Affairs is going to give that uh, stamp. Uh, we don't have any institution. We don't have Buddha. We don't have a Dharma. We don't have a Sangha. In India even lacks a Sangha, which Burma has, Sri Lanka has, Thailand has, Japan has, every country. Chinese have a Sangha. We don't have a Sangha. There are these, you know, as you said, Ambedkar kind of a, uh, Ambedkar, uh, kind of a Buddhism, but they don't know ABC of Buddhism. They don't have any such understanding of such things. No, if you do not have a Sangha, how are you going to play politics? And there are no devotional Buddhists here. In China, Buddhism is a very serious matter. Ordinary people worship Buddha uh, deep inside, like we worship Lord Rama, as serious as that. But in here, it's, it's just, uh, it's okay. You're not supposed to be worship also. Uh, we respect Buddha, that's fine in the true sense, but the Chinese will use it as an instrument in the power. So it's very risky. We have to deal with this issue. Uh, but I think you and me are not going to be a, uh, have any say in this matter. The Americans will tell our bureaucrats and our bureaucrats will decide what they will do. And then most of the time we are not going to get to know also what has really happened. So we have another question, uh, Ambassador. And uh, but before that, I was just reminded of something when you said that how we use uh, in Delhi, South Delhi drawing rooms, you know, how popular versions of Buddhism have permeated. Reiki is one. Everybody wants to do Reiki. The other is Soka Gakkai. When you oh, Gakkai, yeah. So this is what we have done without any deep understanding. And then I'm also reminded we were in a big meeting once and uh, uh, with the Chinese, and uh, this was on a science and spirituality Congress. And we were warned, you know, some of us that please don't mention the Dalai Lama because the Chinese will take offense. But somebody did, you know, after all, it was again a meeting controlled by Americans. So either they told somebody, go ahead, talk about the Dalai Lama. And the person from China, a professor, uh, you know, I, I found that they played so well. I was so impressed by them. Uh, they said, oh, wonderful presentation, this, that, and all. But I have just one question, he said, to the speaker. So he said, which Dalai Lama are you talking about? The Chinese Dalai Lama? And there was pen drop silence in the room. So the whole, uh, you know, effort to bring in the Dalai Lama to embarrass the Chinese was completely you know, refuted, countermanded, turned upside down by the Chinese. Anyhow, here's the question. Uh, thanks, Tobadan, sir, for introducing us to the complexities and nuances of the problem. This is from Professor Chahel, who is a historian from Kurukshetra University. My question is, if China has intensely infiltrated uh, the Dalai Lamas, whatever, in India, why they've claimed some other person in Tibet to be the real Dalai Lama? I don't know whether they've done it. Secondly, if we have already been trapped by China, what should our strategy be to deal with China? I think he mentions, you know, soft power, Buddhism. Uh, how can we strategize uh, against China by using Buddhism as an, uh, or even uh, the Dalai Lama as, uh, uh, as an instrument? I have to prepare for this card with China. Uh, I'm not using anybody else uh, figure, but I'm using Dalai Lama. I think we're having some process. network issues. Awaz aari hai, meri awaz aari hai? Ji, 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 aare. Aapko aare? Hello? Aapko aare, meri awaz? 
According to uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's uh, uh, figure, 400 million Chinese are already Buddhist. Uh, my own figure is about 750 million uh, Chinese are Buddhist. Potentially, 1 billion Chinese could be Buddhist because the more money they are getting, the more they are turning toward uh, Buddhism. And uh, if I have to play the Buddhist card, I will uh, use this 750 million Chinese who are potential Buddhists uh, in my favor. So I will play Buddhism card within China, not through Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, you know, it's another dimension of the Buddhism. It's a tantric version. Uh, Chinese Buddhism is a pure, uh, during the original uh, Buddhism they picked up. You know why? Uh, the, the last time they came was the last Hindu king, uh, Harshvardhana, uh, was the last uh, Gupta king who was there. And after that, when, when, the, when the Khiljis came, when Bhaktiar Khilji came, Bhaktiar Khilji uh, actually destroyed all the universities where the Chinese used to come and study. Once the you know, Indian universities of uh, you know, Takshila, Nalanda, all these places were destroyed, Chinese had no place to come. For what? They didn't want to worship the deities, devis and devatas. They only wanted to understand the philosophy of Buddhism. And the centers of the Indian philosophies were destroyed by the Muslims or whosoever they destroyed it. I don't know. Uh, there, are, there are different, different versions about who destroyed the universities. But once the university was destroyed, the Chinese stopped coming. And the Harshvardhana, I believe, given the autonomy to the Chinese, henceforth, you don't have to come to India. You have the full autonomy. At that time, the title was a Chakravartin title. Most of the Chinese were, kings were given Chakravartin title. Once you get the Chakravartin title, the, you don't have to go to India. India is no longer the Makkha of Buddhism. That's why I say the Chinese Buddhism. Why they say Chinese Buddhism? Because they have got this certificate from the Indians that henceforth you don't have to come to India to take the orders. Where the Pakistan is still going, our own Muslims go to Makkha, to Saudi Arabia. That's the center of, or the Christian go to, 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 to Rome, wherever. But no Buddhists come to India because there is no Buddha here, there's no Dharma, there's no Sangha here. So they claim autonomy for themselves to conduct the Buddhist activities themselves, whether it is Japanese, whether it is Thais or the Chinese. And Tibetans, of course, they have their own autonomy. In fact, we are now depending on the Tibetans rather than Tibetans de depending on us. <laughs> That's the you know pathetic situation we are in. <laughs> we have don't have the others have to we have to rely on others. It's a second hand car. You don't have the original car. You have to driving a second-hand car. So that is the state of affairs that we have. And if we have to play it, uh, and I think Prime Minister Modi did very well in the beginning in 2014-15, when he went to uh, Xi'an, where, uh, the, you know, he went to the real center of Buddhism, where Buddha Dharma, Buddha Dharma was a uh, Tamil Brahmin. There were so many Brahmin actually from South India who introduced Buddhism to China and Vietnam, to, you know, all these people. There was a possibility to link up China and India through Buddhism, but Tibetans will always hijack that. Tibet, you know, the Wuhan process was all about really reconnecting India and Chinese civilization. First Wuhan happened, second was in Mahabalipuram, Somebody interfered, and the whole thing was disrupted. And today, where is the connection, civilization getting linked up again? Americans prevailed and said, China is your enemy. China is your rivalry. This is a permanent, and make sure that you remain a permanent enemy of China. But Chinese are still not saying you are my enemy. It's only we are saying you are you are my enemy. So it's a very strange thing, you know. I do not see uh, answer in these things because in the last two years it's been so indoctrinized in our blood. That it's now very difficult to restart this debate. The Wuhan process is going to start or not? I don't know. Dalai Lama is in a fact, problem. It's not solution. Wuhan, Wuhan. Yeah. In fact, Wuhan has Dalai become Lama known for. Sorry. The Dalai Lama sorry, is sorry. part of Go the ahead. problem. He's not a part of the solution for India-China. As long as Dalai Lama is there, India-China reconciliation can never happen. 
Chinese Buddhism and the Indian Buddhism had never had any problem. Who disrupted the Chinese and Indian connection? The non-Han people. Who are the non the, the Mongols, the Tibetans? They are not non-Han Chinese. The Han Chinese never had any problem with the Indian civilization. Your your philosophies, their philosophy originally picked up from India. You know, so th there are no problems here. If you want to perform a yagna, uh, last year there was a 75th anniversary of our diplomatic relationship. I suggested to MEA, let the pundits of China and let the pundits of India perform a joint yagna at the India gate. Ditto, same, same ditto. You know, in fact, in our own yagna, a one vastu used to come from China. A, a yagna is incomplete without a vastu coming from our realm. What you call it, mandala. You know, it's it's very okay thing for an Indian. If I die in China, my family will be okay. The body doesn't have to come back to India. If a Chinese die in India, it's fine. A Chinese doesn't have to body China again. But if a Chinese and Indian die in Saudi Arabia, it is neither acceptable to the Chinese nor acceptable, nor it will be acceptable to the uh, the, the uh, Arabs. For you to die in uh, Saudi Arabia. So therefore, there are those intrinsic connection which cannot be destroyed so easily. You know, and no yagna can be per complete without a vastu coming from China. And in a stotra, if you say the, uh, the stotra of uh, Ashwardhana, if you read, please catch out uh, on the Google or somewhere the stotra morning uh, chant of uh, Raja um, Ashwardhana. When he performs morning uh, before taking breakfast, he, he invokes this that, uh, you know, Aryavate, uh, Bharat, Bharat Khande, you know, Ujjena Nagare, and wherever he stop it, you know, wherever he situates himself. Then he says, Lanke, Kashmire, Kabule, uh, China Deshe. So, China Deshe is part of your internal spiritual disposition. You do not consider China outside your spiritual world. So it is that deep connection that we have forgotten. Read some of the good old literatures where we are so, you know, they, 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 you know, our destiny, the last spiritual destiny of a Chinese and an Indian is same. Now, don't uh, <laughs> interpret this thing in a Chinese Communist Party term. China has to be seen as a civilization. India has to be seen as a civilization. Don't say it is BGP India or a Congress India or a Communist Party India. No, that's a very narrow part of our interpretation. Interpretation of India is much deeper, you know, from the Rig Veda onwards. And it's so ingrained to reduce it to say, you know, this is my India. Uh, I don't think anybody has got a copyright to do that. And uh, that's why unless those things are understood in a proper perspective, you know, Dalai Lama is a, it's a you know, 17th century phenomena. You know, Hun Sen came 2,000 years ago. Yeah, this is 400 years old. <laughs> the, the other Nalanda is 800 years old. You know, the Nalanda um, uh, priest used to uh, go for the performance of the setting up a temple in China. A Chinese was the vice chancellor of Nalanda University in the 9th century. And, you know, there, there's so many Saravasti, Vikram Shila. All these <laughs> universities were headed by the Chinese. And, and in the process, they also took most of the kings which used to be enthroned in China. A pandit has to go from India, either from Kerala or from uh, Andhra Pradesh. If you go to north of Ladakh, there is a Xinjiang area. There were 24, sorry, 44 kingdoms. All the kingdoms, the priests used to come from Andhra Pradesh. They were Dravidian uh, priests. Like today, if you go to Pashupati Nath in Nepal, the priest is uh, from... Uh, I think from from Kerala, it's a tradition and it's going on for many I don't know how many centuries. So in China, the priests used to go from Dravidian countries, you know, Naga Arjuna area places. Uh, Forty-four big big uh, areas used to be controlled by the Indian priest. That was the connection. But so we have forgotten. We are creating different boundaries, which is not good for us. So therefore, I think when we are talking about all these things, we have to see in the Indic perspective. We don't say Buddhist perspective or a Hindu perspective, Indic perspective. But to say, no, Indian perspective is only Hindu perspective, is then you are destroying yourselves. 
that attaching Indic perspective, or you can say Sanskritic cosmopolitans. You know, I go to Java, Sumatra, or Indonesia. Some waiter comes, a girl comes, say, what's your name? Chan Chuan Chan, some, something he says. So what is the, what does it mean? He says it comes from the Sanskrit word called Sujata. Now, he, she is a Polynesian, Polynesian. Can you imagine Fiji? Whole of Indo-Pacific and the continental part of China is a Sanskritic world. It is us who are saying, you are my enemy. That one is my enemy. That one is my enemy. Nobody is talking India as an enemy. Only we are taking others as an enemy. So I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, we are victim of a propaganda being played by somebody else. So what can we do? We are, we have to go with that. Nobody can stop it. Well, you know, speaking of the Wuhan dialogue, now Wuhan is known for something entirely different for the virus. But, uh, you know, the civilizational connection, many have tried to leverage it, but somehow in the modern world of real politic, even in the ME and elsewhere, they don't seem to think there's much left in it. And as to the Chinese Buddhist connection after the Cultural Revolution and that modernization process, they feel that it's very hard to revive it. I mean, this is the counter argument that today you're not known for your ancient achievements, giving dharma, giving ethics, giving scripts, giving ideas. And, you know, the great Chinese epic journey to the West, which is, of course, a journey to India is no longer resonant. People do not have the deep cultural memory. I myself have visited China many, many times. But I must say, I completely agree, there's no hostility to India, absolutely none. But there's no sense of, uh, uh, you know, what we call in Hindi, Atmiyata. There's no sense of, uh, uh, you know, warmth or uh, civilizational bond either. You find more of that if you go to Kyoto. I don't see it in Tokyo. But or in Vietnam, Cambodia, definitely. Uh, so I'm saying in modern China, the memory is very, I mean, the younger people, they're consumers, they wear uh, branded clothes. They don't have even memories of the Cultural Revolution where their own grandparents were sent, some of them were sent to re-education camps. And uh, it's very interesting. I was always, I visited many universities in China and I was always said, I was always told that China and India never went to war. I said, what about 62? They said only that was the only exception. But they were very, very clear that uh, China would never attack India. And uh, unfortunately, that discourse is gone today. We view them with so much suspicion. And uh, uh, I mean, your points are really well taken. Uh, and uh, what the role that Americans are playing is also uh, very complex. I was just reading... Uh, uh, you know, yesterday I was reading this uh, report from. Uh, I don't, I'm sure you know about this. Uh, uh, this report it's it's been published by the Lowy Institute in collaboration with Center for Strategic and International Studies, and it's about after Xi Jinping, like what are the future scenarios for leadership succession in China? And they've got like four scenarios. You see, they've they've talked about one, one is that next year. 10 years are up, he demits power, or then he plans to retire in the 21st Party Congress in 2027, or even in the 22nd in 2032. Or there's a challenge or a coup, or there's an unexpected death or incapacitation. So uh, I, think that, I think that the US uh, strategic thinking is working over, over time and overnight to, to think about scenarios. I was talking to somebody in His Holiness's Bureau office, and they, and they told me there have been seven attempts already, coup attempts in China. So we don't know what's happening behind the bamboo curtain, so to speak. But I think all your remarks are very well taken. They, they add to the discourse, and we look forward to publishing uh, possibly a slightly toned down version, <laughs> because you've been uh, very, very frank, and I'm I'm very grateful to you for that, though you're a former diplomat. So uh, we'll we'll wind up now. If there's no more questions, uh, uh, if there are any questions, please send them now, or otherwise I will I will have to thank uh, uh, Ambassador Funchok Stopdanji for his wonderful uh, pr presentation and invite him to Shimla when times are better. Of course, the well, I come here very often. Been... I come to Artek very often. 
you know the, sir the come and visit us next time you come please stay with us <laughs> you're most welcome and uh, uh i think professor Man, chahal has a question Man. yes sir, go ahead professor no chahal you, you've got the last word go ahead sir this is this is not question i have already posted uh, posted on the chat please read it out he says sir i have reservations on your comments on ambedkar's navayan as he had deep knowledge of buddhism and virtually revived it in modern india yeah yeah sure sure i i have also read a lot of things you know i have been to kolkata at the ramakrishna mission they have invited me uh, how they have to readjust with buddhism and uh, uh, i think that there is a doctrinal difference between buddhism and hinduism except uh, that the buddhism does not believe in god ishwar uh, that's the only thing the the hindu uh, priest used to have i think they still have reservation on the buddhism uh, that's okay the my point with the ramakrishna mission was that if buddhism can be used like the chinese are using in modernizing india you know after all china has become rich by getting investment from taiwan across the state through buddhist channels who played the uh, cross strait uh, economic diplomacy by the, by the buddhist channels all the masters even the ministry of defense of taiwan and china used the buddhist uh, channels to bring investment from uh, uh, you know uh, uh, non uh, what do, what you call overseas chinese into the mainland china and this is how chinese modernization has come into being partly americans are responsible americans also projected in the 80s and the 90s given all the technology and the investment to become china rich now i said to ramakishan mission that look all our areas in calcutta in bihar in up people are very poor very poverty stricken if the money can be attracted from the buddhist world to project the buddhist centers to promote the historical places less people will come from bihar to calcutta as a rickshaw puller you know it will lessen the burden on the calcutta city and apart than you getting from bangladesh and other places look at buddhism from that point of view after all buddhist countries are rich today you know you may have problem doctrinal problem with the buddhism that's okay but the, i know uh, dr karan singh i was sitting in iccr he was chairman i was one of the members one of the professor from um, delhi university said sir this year we must have some projects on buddhism you know what dr karan singh said us harami ka naam bhi le lena wo to ishwar mein bhi believe nahi karta tha he said and i was sitting there and i said then he realized that stoplin is also here no then it's it's you know deep inside we understand that there is no no reconciliation there's so much hatred for buddha in this in our own land among top people who make policies you know then you say there is no spirit lying in china the chinese know very well that you don't respect you know i was part of the bjp delegation mr mj akbar led it uh and we went to uh, beijing and shanghai for a civilizational dialogue so we told there were some professors i was there mj akbar was there he was heading the delegation we sat in the uh, in the conference hall we gave our presentations and suddenly and one chinese professor came up sorry gentlemen what kind of a civilizational dialogue you want to have so that we presented all our papers well as far as we understand you have a civilization which believes in inequalities injustice we have a we have a civilization which believes in equality and justice and don't forget that communism communist party of china thrived on the fertile ground of buddhism land was already fertile because there were no caste system in china and for the maoist uh, sorry the marxist and leninist they could thrive very well Marxism could not come to India because the land was not fertile. Now you have a civilization which is based on inequalities. We have a equal. Where do we meet? Please tell us. And we had no answer. So it's not that they do not understand these issues. So whatever we may try, we are Buddhist country. And practically, we don't believe. There are serious issues. There are serious issues. That is why, to be very frank, Buddha has been driven out. and chinese understand that 
how many Indians? I mean, I would say, okay, fine, decoration piece. Nehru had some something he used in statecraft, Buddha, because he could not build India based on uh, you know something else other than Buddha, because other than Buddha was only uh, only in mythology, only Buddha was historical. So we had this problem at the time of independence itself. That's very clear. Even under this government also, we are not able to change that. Can we change the symbol of the nation, the emblem, the Ashoka stump? We cannot. You know, there are so many things. It has to be based on historical facts. So uh, while uh, we take all these things, but we are also very clear that diplomacy work. So now Dalai Lama is important because he's the only Buddhist who is willing to work with the Hindu Brahminism. That's a fact of life. And the rest of the Buddhist world do not take him seriously. You know, and that's that's uh, well understood. Uh, you think the Thais take him seriously? You think the Taiwanese or that? Well, they use it for political purpose. In the, from the doctrinal perspective, since Buddha is a antithesis of uh, Hinduism, and Dalai Lama says, no, we are one, uh, then no, oh, that is uh, that is a uh, little to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, uh, sir, 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 the question the question was about Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, Please, what, he's what, asking what a question. That? He's saying that you 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 mentioned that the Ambedkarites don't understand Buddhism. So so he said he had reservations over that remark. That was the no point. no no. I'm not saying the doctrinal aspect. Of I have a problem with the Ambedkar uh, Buddhism is that they take Ambedkar above Buddha. That is something uh, no Buddhist, that's why Buddhist world do not take them seriously. So you are, you are making a caste out of Buddhism. That's a, that's a, uh, Buddha was a casteless and you are still want to make Buddha a caste, anti-Brahminism, that will not duck. Best Buddhists are Brahmins. You know, I say, I don't think any uh, Ambedkar scholars understand Buddhism better than a Brahmin. Actually, Buddhism was propagated by Brahmins themselves, Brahmin intellectual people. Brahmin was just, a, we use it in a different manner, in a negative manner. Who could understand the deep philosophy of Not me, not somebody else. It was only Brahmins who had the actual knowledge. They are the ones who, most of the people who turned to Buddhism were the Brahmins, not Ambedkarites, not me, not Ladakhis. Ladakhi Buddhism is a very modern phenomenon. The actual original Buddhists were Brahmins. So uh, what I'm saying is that in the geopolitical context, the Brahmin, uh, the Ambedkar Buddhism has no, I don't think they have any imagination to shaping India in a geopolitical way, in a Buddhist way. They do, they do make a good vote bank. I understand in the internal political part of India. I don't think there are international geopolitical card vis-a-vis -vis China or vis-a-vis -vis some other country. That is, uh, I don't see, I have not come across any intellectual uh, scholar from the Ambedkarite community to, to interact with me on the geopolitics of Buddhism. Well, they have problems. They, they, they do have knowledge about Buddhism. I'm not suggesting that. Since the topic is only about the geopolitics of Buddhism, the Ambedkarites have not come forward. They are still debating within the Hindu, you know, whatever problems that they have. Uh, Buddha is regarded as a symbolic importance. Sir, may I submit something? I think I think we are out of time, and uh, I think that uh, um, Ambassador Stopdan has done a wonderful job. So, uh, if you want to say something, uh, Acha, I've got a question from IIT uh, Madras, for Professor Shripad Karmalkarji. He says, uh, "Can you comment on the role of Sarnath International?" Nigma Institute. I had been there to participate in a three-day dialogue between scientists and Buddhist monks, many of whom were from Tibet and was greatly impressed. So this will be the last one. And then Dr. Chahil can give the vote of thanks on behalf of the Institute. <laughs> Where did you go to uh, Nigma? Which place is this? Sarnath? Sarnath. He, they, he went to the Sarnath Higher Tibetan Studies Institute, I suppose. Yeah, I think, you know, earlier they used to call it Lamaism. Uh, felt very shy because Lamaism has nothing to do with Buddhism. Then they, from Lamaism, they left and they said it came to Buddhism. From Buddhism, now they are saying uh, science of mind. 
you know, it's very fashionable these days for these institutes to talk about science of mind, but it because it's very catchy. Uh, you know, it in 21st century you have to coin new words uh, to go with climate change, environmental, you know, Kisan Andolan. Uh, Dalai Lama tweeted on Kisan Andolan, which Indian state uh, suppressed it, obviously. Uh, with Gita Thurman, he also did it. Uh, it looks very fashionable uh, to talk about uh, quantum physics and, uh, you know, obviously, but what is the practical utility? The Chinese are coming with 5G. Can the Tibetans come out with 5G through uh, tantric system? I don't know. Uh, in Ladakh, I'm facing with a problem of 5G. Right now, in front of me, there is a 5G tower you know, the Chinese have installed, which is posing threat to my existency. What is the use that Nyingmapa has told me there is there is this quantum physics that in your mind, they, I can control you. What is the use of it? I, I, I have no practical utility about, you know, the science of mind. They, they said inner, you know, they always talk something inner, inner aspect, of inner strength, and inner power and what is that? If you have such an inner uh, inner power, kindly liberate your land from the communist. They don't, no, I I don't take them seriously. Whether Nyingma power, Karma power, Sarma power, whatever their instruments. You know there is this uh, uh, Owen Lethemore, the Chinese uh, professor in the beginning of the 21st century. He is the only American uh, who uh, the first American to study Orientalism. Because if you from, go from the Shanghai, uh, they see China, 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 China. They thought up to North Arctic, there will be China. So Oman Lethemore said, no, beyond Great Wall, there is no China. There is a Mongol, there is Tibetan, there is Uyghur, there is some other Tang, Mongol, like that. So uh, Oman Lethemore says that actually the Tibetan monks have no core values. They're like pundits, you know. <clears throat> If you if you give them money, they can go to any place. If you if you hire a pandit to do a puja at home, you give them good food, give them offer them good money, they do perform puja at your house. And next day they go to another house. Third day they go to another house. So the Tibetans are saying, the Chinese are saying, you have been a good priest. You have performed puja at my house. Sometimes you went to India. Sometimes you went to Mongolia. But today, the priests cannot claim for a state. Priests are priests. Even in India, the Brahmins can't say that I, I have India. The, India is Kshatriya, I think. It's a, the state is ruled by non-Brahmins, Kshatriya, who control the politics, the power. So the, 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 the dependent lamas were more like Brahmins, who used to go from one place to another for performing pujas. They performed in the court of Chinese uh, emperors, all the emperors throughout from Tang dynasty to Manchu dynasty. So today say that, no, 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 we are a separate nation. They don't take it seriously. No, the world is taking it seriously. So if you have a place, you have a, you have a respect as long as you are a priest. If he says, no, I am also a king, then I think there are serious questions being raised. That is a dilemma. Even we are not able to recognize that. You know, how do you recognize a state? On the one hand, we say democracy, transparent, but on the other hand, say, no, it, it has to be, leader has to be chosen through reborn, uh, you know, what you call it? Uh, uh, reincarnation. Reincarnation. What kind of a principle and aren't we then hypocrites? Even the Americans have passed a resolution that the, the, the leadership has to be uh, chosen through tantric methods. I mean, in 21st century, are we kidding? Either we are serious about the people of Tibet who has to be liberated from this kind of a mindset or that you perpetuate a system in the base because since China is a communist party who do not believe in this, so therefore uh, for the sake of communist uh, criticizing China, you go for tantric practices. It, to me, it looks like, you know, you know it's, it's a very uh, difficult proposition. You know, I tell you one thing. When I was a small child, uh, around six years old, my grandmother used to call me sometime, and because there is a new cuff, you know, baby cuff, which is cow has given, and the fresh milks are given, and the, the cream of the first milk is very good. So all of us used to go to grandmother's house, and grandmother, please give me those malai, you know, the malai. Grandmother says, no, I can't give you malai, but I'll give you good milk and yogurt. I said, no, I want the malai. She says, no, I can't give you malai. She says, why? I said, why? She says, no, I have to keep for my lama. 
you know, because I said, why Lama? Because he will show me the path after my death. She has been indoctrinized in such a manner, not only in this life, you have to look after a Lama. If the, even after you are dead, you have to make sure. So her grandchildren are suffering from poverty. You know, I was lean and thin with no calories in my body and protein. The Lama is fat like this. Now, in 21st century, I said, look, the people who exploited me has to be worshipped, you know, and I can uh, go through poverty and malnourish. I don't think that is a, something that Indian state should be promoting. And Indian people who believe deeply in democracy should be promoting such feudal thoughts, you know, irrational ideas, just because uh, we do uh, if if the Chinese had not liberated Tibet, then we could have gone uh, gone there and created democracy there. Uh, that day we didn't have the power to do that, but the Chinese did there. Somebody had to go there to liberate Tibetans. You know, there are 6.3 Tibetan poor people. They used to work for few serf, including Dalai Lama. All the feudal lords came to India. Ordinary people didn't come here. Those who you see in Shimla and around, there are feudal people. They were, the peasants were left behind. Today, you think the peasants are welcoming. They're waiting for these people to come back to offer their land back to these feudals. No, no, this is why the perspective is very different. I've been to China and I've been to Tibet. Nobody is waiting for people coming from Dharamsala to rule them, over them again. It's a fantasy we are living in. I think we must understand the reality. Reality is that the Tibet is also an ordinary place. Human being lives there, cold climate, agriculture, animals there. Human people live the like people live in Himachal Pradesh or, or Punjab or Haryana. But but you make it fantasize, you know, romanticize a Dalai Lama, something like that, create a psycho psychotic kind of a thing, which is that distorts the reality, the real distort the geography and the reality of the people. I'm sorry to give this leftist uh, perspective, but that's a reality. And that's why I have Chinese will have the edge. End of the day, even we have done so. We have brought so many land reforms. Where are those, uh, you know, uh, uh, those, those uh, uh, big, big landlords that UP and Bihar used to have, or even Punjab? Maybe in Bihar, a few, few landlords are still there. But we have liberated most part of Rajasthan and uh, rest of India from the feudal system. Well, on that note, on that liberative note, liberation both here and the here and now, and maybe a little bit of Malay for the hereafter. I want to thank you very much for that extremely candid and no holds barred uh, talk. It's made us really think deeply about several issues across the board. And uh, I thank you once again. And next time you're here, sir, please, please do stay with us. And yeah. uh, for our fellows, yeah. uh, you know, we are having a condolence for Mr. Keshar Singh's father who passed away. So we'll close now and we may reassemble with adequate social distancing and masks downstairs. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank, Thank you, you for that brilliant presentation. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. So very uh, unstructured and loose uh, manner, but which is my style. I can't help it. But it, I think it was extremely to the point. You've thought, you've thought through most of these issues. I always find people going round and round and waffling, but you've come straight to the point. You've, you've said it as you felt it and as you thought through it. So I really respect that. Thank you, sir. Stay safe. Uh, in spite Thank of you. the Chinese 5G, we'll get there. Eventually, the Ambani's will put up something there too, hopefully. So on Adani that note, also. thank Adani. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.